Uh, Panorama 1 uh, actually represents a breakthrough study um, because it's the first study in multiple myeloma that demonstrates a clinical benefit that's meaningful um, to a new class of compound called the histone deacetylase inhibitors. Um, these drugs have been under study in myeloma for some time. Um, the original premise is that they could dually block protein degradation by inhibiting a thing called the agrosome, which is an escape pathway for the proteasome. So the rationale was to combine these drugs um, with bortezomib as one example, and so enhance the therapeutic index of bortezomib. And we now realize, of course, there's more to these drugs than just the agrosome, um, that they have profound epigenetic effects, which are very important, where they stabilize the genome and can actually reduce the sort of mutagenic thrust that myeloma obviously has in, in abundance. So the rationale for it, their use has been really promising for some time. The problem has been the clinical results, where with the, uh, unfortunately, the disappointment of the Veronistat program, where after much promise in the early phase development of that drug, the phase threes showed benefits, but they were very modest, and they were offset by substantial challenges and side effects. So Panorama constituted a next effort at this with a more potent histone deacetylase inhibitor called Panabinostat. And the preclinical rationale for its use was strong. The single agent signal from it was also quite modest, but it was nonetheless interesting because we did see stabilization of disease. We did see some minimal responses in the very early development of the drug, which were compelling. And then when we combined it with bortezomib in the phase one setting, but with a very carefully thought out dose and schedule, and most importantly, the incorporation of steroids to minimize side effects as much as anything else, we saw some really interesting responses in highly refractory patients. In Panorama 2, which we published in Blood last year, that was a multi-center phase two trial of about 55 patients who were not only relapsed and refractory, but absolutely had to be refractory to bortezomib to enter the trial. We were able to actually generate a 35% response rate um, with the three drug combination, which is remarkable if you think about it, because it showed that we would be able to overdrive bortezomib resistance in an absolute way. And what was particularly compelling was if you looked at the minimal responses or better, that exceeded 55%, which was in itself a noteworthy. And the final sort of icing on the cake was that in those patients with adverse cytogenetics, as defined by 17P deletion, 414 translocation, uh, and also 1416, we were able to demonstrate in those patients um, that the response rate was 43%, which was compelling. And again, provided a rationale for the taking the combination forward in the Panorama 1 trial. So the Panorama 1 trial was a global study. Uh, it involved over 35 countries, 200 centers and more, uh, and it was a comparison in less heavily pretreated patients of bortezomib, dexamethasone, and placebo versus bortezomib, dexamethasone, and panabinostat. And what we are very pleased to report is that the primary endpoint of the trial, which was progression-free survival, showed a statistically significant benefit in favor of the three drugs. Very importantly, it was clinically meaningful. The difference was actually about four months, which when you think about it may not on the face of it sound like a great deal, but if you remember that bortezomib was approved against high-dose dexamethasone with a three-month median difference, that bortezomib liposomal doxorubicin versus bortezomib was approved off a three-month difference, and these drugs are all approved accordingly and, of course, have really shown benefit clinically as well, as well as survival benefit. We think it's a very impressive start and what we also feel is that when you look at the responses between the two arms, the degree of high quality responses showed an almost twofold difference in favor of the three drug combination over the two. Now, it's too early really to talk about survival benefit because there haven't been enough events uh, to actually give maturity to that analysis. But the initial trend in the survival, I think, uh, is suggesting that perhaps with longer follow up, we'll see a difference in favor of the three drugs as well. That would hopefully be the case um, based upon our experience with previous studies and also the fact that the way we believe this drug works is not only immediately in the context of therapeutic benefit, but also perhaps in the longer term by its effects on epigenetics. So we're very encouraged by that. And we also presented um, some subset analyses looking at patients with high-risk cytogenetics, relapsed refractory disease, prior bortezomib exposure, and prior lenalidomide exposure. And what you saw was that in these groups, the hazard ratio improved and actually became 0.5 or close to for these particular higher risk groups. And in that context, I think that's very interesting because it suggests that this particular three drug platform is an ideal choice 
um, for patients whom high risk features may exist. Now, one caveat to all of this is that we did see significant toxicities. Um, we saw a substantial thrombocytopenia, we saw a lot of fatigue, and we saw a number of gastrointestinal side effects. The good news was that with dose reduction, supportive care, and also making the bortezomib weekly as you moved into the maintenance phase of the trial, a lot of these side effects got much better. And when we built this study, bortezomib intravenous was the approved approach. Subcutaneous had not been approved, so we couldn't actually use it. And obviously, if you go to subcutaneous bortezomib, the side effect profile is much better. So we're very hopeful that going forward with weekly bortezomib, for example, sub-Q bortezomib, and other strategies, um, we'll be able to improve on the tolerability. And the final comment is that, of course, there are now newer uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors that are really gaining some traction. And at the EHA meeting, we'll be presenting data. My colleagues, Dr. Nuparaje and Andrew Yi, and we're actually participating in these trials, will show the efficacy, or promise, I would say, of a new histone deacetylase inhibitor called ericolinostat, or AC1215, which is very HDAC6 selective and has the promise of fewer side effects, particularly thrombocytopenia. So I think that the excitement around Panorama 1 isn't just panobinostat. It is that the HDAC field has reopened. And whilst a lot of us believed in veronostat, myself included, particularly its efficacy when it's combined with imids, for example, um, we were obviously disappointed by the phase three results, which uh, showed a statistically significant difference, but only less than a month in terms of real clinical benefit. Obviously, that wasn't enough to take that program forward. Now, of course, with four months of difference as a median, recognizing that influences those who really get benefit from it versus those who may not be so responsive, um, we're very excited and think the whole field for histone deacetylase inhibition has had something of a renaissance uh, going forward.